I am Juanita Salisbury. That's me. Um, I do have a, a PhD in biopsychology as well as a degree in landscape architecture, or as I like to say, 14 years of college. Um, but people sometimes ask me, what does biopsychology have anything to do with landscape architecture? And when I was in psychology, I studied ingestive behavior. What I mean by that is eating and drinking. And now that I look at pollination and pollination biology, pollination is really at the basis of the food chain, so my career has basically come full circle. So that's what it has to do with that. Sometimes the answers come to you in time. Tonight I'm going to talk about um, some broad subjects, um, basically about plants, why California native plants, how to choose plants, what are pollinators, how to create a habitat plan, and then maintenance protocols. So a lot of big, broad topics, but I do dive in deep into these topics with some really tasty science. And um, so hang on. And you'll, I think you'll really enjoy it. Um, in each slide, I always like to try to have a photograph. I do a lot of macro photography of the various plants in the gardens that I maintain in Palo Alto uh, because I like to keep track of the species that are feeding upon the plants and be sure that they're actually uh, doing what they're supposed to do. Okay, plants. So many benefits of plants. Here I have a picture. This is a beautiful place up in Washington, our Olympic National Park up on the uh, peninsula up there. A million acres of pristine forest. Okay, just looking at the picture makes you feel good. Um, so basically, if you're in nature, we know that there's calming effects on your nervous system. The fragrance of plants, plants uh, emit aerosols that can actually impact how your immune system is working. Plants help define a sense of place and provide a feeling of connection between people and other living things. They improve climate, temperature, air quality, water quality, and more. Plants do a lot of things. They solve many issues. Okay, I like to call this my big science slide or uh, protons or uh, photons to uh, protein plant, uh, slide. So how do we get those photons from the sun to turn into protein? Plants. Plants are the beginning of everything, literally, on Earth. Um, they're the primary producers of food and the basis of the food chain. So we take energy from sun, the sun, that, those photons that we have as light, and that is converted by plants, the first trophic level, which means that plants make their own food from those photons. And then those plants are then eaten by other things to access those photons. They can't, obviously, plant, or people and animals can't use photons directly. You have to get the energy from the sun from plants. So the plants convert those uh, photons into food that's eaten by insects and other animals. So here we have the floral and vegetative resources. Here's my hand showing a big, fat, juicy caterpillar on Grindelia camporum. Very excited to see this because caterpillars are the preferred food to feed baby birds. They're nice and juicy. They're soft. If you've ever seen an adult bird stuff a, a caterpillar down their baby's throats, it's not gentle. So you want something soft and juicy. Caterpillars. Um, gardens with at least 70% native plant species are needed to sustain populations of birds. I'll talk about that in a second. 37% of our uh, animal species on the planet are plant-eating insects, the so-called herbivores. And many other animals rely on insects as food to access the sun's energy, those photons that they can't get any other way. So, obviously then, I see plants differently than most people. I don't see plants as decorations. I used to. I don't anymore. They taught us in landscape architecture food, or school to shrub it up. Yeah, that's a little not very specific. So, um, but really, what plants really are is they are food. And so one of the ways I choose plants in a nursery 
is I look for the plant that has caterpillars on it because I'm getting a twofer. I'm getting a plant and possibly some butterflies. This is a good way to uh, have those in your garden. So here's a study that came out last year. This study was done by uh, Narango Talami and Mara um, out at the University of Delaware. And they found that in residential neighborhoods, a minimum of 70% of native plants in each yard was needed to sustain populations of chickadees. Below 70%, the ability to sustain the birds dropped to zero. This is a minimum. We don't know why it's 70%. That, that science is still being worked out. Um, but this is a good number to remember. Um, so here's some pictures of plants in our gardens. I have several in Palo Alto that are native plant habitats. Um, here we have a nice caterpillar on uh, Scrofularia californica, a checker spot butterfly caterpillar on Sedalsia, gray hair streak butterfly, actually she's laying an egg there on Eriogonum fasciculatum, and then the Anna swallowtail, beautiful caterpillar on Periteridia. So why California native plants? California is a treasure. We are one of about 30 biodiversity hotspots on the planet. We have almost 8,000 species of plants here in this state, more than any other state in the United States. Um, and we also have 1,600 species of native bees, more than any other state in the United States. We have about 4,000 species across the United States. Um, Honeybees, I'm not going to really talk about. They're not native, and they're probably not really that important. Um, and we have such a huge number of native plant species, largely because we have so many unique ecosystems in California, okay? and because of our 1,600 species of native bees. When I say honeybees may not be important, what I mean is they're not really that important to our native plants. They might be important to agriculture, but in terms of our plant species diversity, that's been here for hundreds of thousands of years, and honeybees are a recent introduction. And these are a, a few pictures I've taken over the years. Um, and we know that species, insect species, including pollinators, are declining worldwide. They're in big trouble. And in some areas of the world, insect species have declined 70%. And if we lose insects, everything will collapse in terms of the environment. So again, why California native plants? Uh, California native plants uh, evolved here in California to our different uh, climates that we have. We've got coastal climate, we've got desert climate, we have alpine, we have chaparral, we have you know, really everything. So um, the ones that we like to use around here, the ones that are well adapted to our hot, dry summers and wet winters, um, are drought tolerant, especially after they're established. So once they're in and their roots have made friends with everything else underground, they're largely, uh, you don't need to water them during the summertime. Uh, native plants are largely preferred over non-native plants by pollinators. Native plants depend largely on native pollinators for reproduction. They're uh, mutually beneficial to each other. They can't exist without the other. If you have non-native plants, they can escape cultivation and infest natural areas and bring in disease or exotic pests. And planting native keeps California looking like California. Just a few uh, of the appropriate native species can really help. And Native plants provide an abundance of ecosystem services. Okay, here was one of our gardens that we did. Um, this was nothing but ivy and a big uh, non-native tree here, a couple of poppies. We approached the city about removing the ivy and planting it up. This was our third garden. And then afterwards, um, this was the first year after planting. A big difference in the way it looks. But this was probably ivy for decades, so really not supplying any ecosystem services. Again, why California native plants? Now this is old information. Uh, it says California hosts approximately 6,500 species, subspecies and variety of native plants, many of which are not found anywhere else in the world. 
um, and many animal species depend on the native plants for food and shelter. It's estimated that 66% of California's endemic plant species, endemic means not found anywhere else, just in California, will experience decreases of up to 80% in the size of their ranges in the next 100 years. This is a prediction. We can change the future. It doesn't have to happen this way. Here's a couple of examples of our great uh, different types of ecosystems. This is the very tip of Point Reyes, pointing up here to Bodega Head. And you can see that we've got some sand here, some lupins, very different from Edgewood Park, which is Oak Chaparral. So lots of different kinds of plants in different places. How do you choose plants? So we're going to go through this step by step. And by the end of tonight, you guys will have all the information you need to take home and do this in your own yards. So we start, we start with the cho choosing plant algorithm. How do you decide? Uh, one thing to ask yourself is, what is locally appropriate? And the answer is, what plants were here in the past? And you can research this question by going to this website here. Um, and you can uh, look at the, uh, uh, the slides later, uh, which will be available from the city for you. And that takes you to the Consortium of California Herbaria. Let's say you want to look at your town before 1900. What was here? So you can do a search um, by date, and it will tell you the uh, species who collected it, the date, um, the county. This is Santa Clara County, where I am. Um, and some notes about where it is. You know, some of those are more specific than others. And also, you can buy or order from local reputable sources. So that's one way. But a better way to choose plants, and here it comes. Get ready. Hang on. Use the calscape.org database. This is constantly being updated. And I did uh, a search here to see what's in California. 7,979 plant species, almost 8,000 species to choose from. And they break this down into, we've got all plants, trees, shrubs, perennials, annuals, grasses, succulents, vines, ferns, sun plants, shade plants, part shade, uh, ground covers, butterfly hosts, what do the caterpillars eat, uh, hedges, bank stabilization, low water, very low water, damp soil, and very easy. So they've done the work for you. This is an excellent database to use. Um, I would definitely go to this, spend some time looking around about Calscape. The planting guide has the information that you need to take care of these plants. It also tells you where you can get the plants. So you can go and click on the nurseries link to see if those nurseries have those plants. Uh, most nurseries have availability lists online, so you don't have to make a waste a trip. You can just look and see what they have. You can create a, an account here to make a plant list. And then they have a section called butterflies. And this is probably a good place to start. And the reason for that is well, let's actually, let's look at Milbrae for a second. So if you're interested in what to plant in Milbrae, you can say what's local. So I did a little search for Milbrae. You have 698 different species to choose from here, probably more than you could probably ever fit into your yard. So something for everybody here. You've got 32 species of trees, looks like 106 shrubs, and so on and so forth. So a lot. There's a lot available to choose from. The better question, and remember I said I studied eating and drinking, and here it is, people. The best question here is who to feed. Remember, without insects, the rest of our ecosystems are going to collapse um, because plants uh, are the only way we're going to get those photons. So consider, plant species need insects and pollinators to survive. What we find is that Species that have biological pollinators, you have more rapid speciation. 
So there are plants, a few plants that are wind pollinated, but the ones that are pollinated by bugs and other things, animals, you have more rapid speciation. So that's a clue that tells you that biology is important to make life possible. Sort of redundant, really. So what I'm saying here is biological factors may be more important consideration considerations than abiotic factors like climate, geology, water, for ter determining what to plant. So it completely flips it on its head. Consider who to feed. And so I did a little search to see how many butterflies you have up here in Millbrae, and there are 331 species. So if you go to this page, you can decide which of these you'd like to have in your yard. Plant those plants and they will come. It's that easy. I mean, it, it actually works. And this is what is so surprising to me. So this is how I determine, for the most part, what I would like to plant, is I want to know who I'm feeding. But remember this. This is why I put this in red. Biological factors, OK? Sorry, a slide without a picture. I think it's the only one. What plants to use and why? So the easy way to do a planting plan is to break it down. Start with trees first, then go to shrubs, then perennials, then vines, and annuals, and so forth. Start with your big stuff. So let's start with trees. Why trees? Um, are California native species, many are drought tolerant once established. Trees, because of their large structure, they pr provide hubs, lots of habitat for species to use when they move around an environment. Okay? It's great for a bird to be able to hide out in a tree where a hawk can't swoop down and get it. So hubs are kind of like airline hubs, like Atlanta and San Francisco, where the airlines go in before they head off to some other place. Trees can provide large nectar sources as well as other habitat resources for food and butterfly, uh, for food uh, for butterfly and moth larva. And trees are keystone species. Okay, a lot of other species rely on trees. We have a, a number of different ones. So a many, uh, a few of the many, lots of uh, oak species. I've just I'm showing Quercus agrifolia here, but we have a lot of oak species to use. Uh, really great, um, provides lots of food and habitat for many. Uh, Prunus salicifolia, another powerhouse of um, uh, uh, vegetative resources, Fraxinus velutina, uh, Circus occidentalis, which we've got one of these, um, the so called red bud here. Um, Circocarpus carpus betuloides, Aeschylus californica. Lyanothamnus, and so forth. So just a few of the many species that we have. What I always tell people is choose wisely. Uh, you don't want to have a really huge tree in your 10-foot side yard. You want to make sure that the tree is appropriately sized. And the CalScape database tells you how big these things get. So again, the homework has been done. The information is out there. Ah. Probably one of the best things that trees do in terms of ecosystem services, trees help to save water. Here's a, the lonely road out to Lemoore during the uh, Thanksgiving break to my in-law's house. A fallow field, and that goes for miles. That's agriculture. Um, so that's what a landscape looks like without any vegetation at all. There's probably not much in terms of living things out here. Maybe some things in the soil, but who knows. And then here we have at Foothill Park in Palo Alto, big Quercus agrifolia, the coast live oak. As you can see, huge tree. This guy here is my six foot three inch tall husband for scale. So you can really get a sense of how big these trees are. And probably not going to work in the side yard. It's really just too big. But oaks are long lived. They add a lot of shade, and they provide a sense of place. Trees help save water. So they absorb water and release it into the air, cooling and cleaning it. And trees form half of the rain cycle. So going back to grade school, when you learned about the water cycle, you probably remember the picture of the oceans and the mountains. 
the clouds forming over the ocean as the evaporation happens, clouds heading over to the mountains, dropping the rain, going back down through the rivers into the sea. That's only half the story. Trees do the other half. That's how we get these rivers of water in the sky is through trees. So you want more rain, plant more trees. It's a direct relationship. So obviously, if you don't have trees, then you can get deserts because there's no moisture in the atmosphere. Um, and trees also um, improve water quality by filtering rainwater, and they slow down the impacts of heavy rain. Everybody runs under a tree when it starts raining because they're not going to get rained on as much. Um, and then trees reduce flooding, and they stabilize soil. Again, oaks providing lots of larval food. Here we have a, a California sister butterfly, and um, they eat oaks. So again, you know, they're inter interrelated. This I actually pulled off of the Calscape site on their planting guide page. And everybody always thinks about what's happening above ground. But the life below ground is crucial because that's what keeps plants alive. And you can save, you can bring up a substantial amount of moisture from the water table and deeper groundwater reserves by interspersing deep-rooted trees and shrubs like the ones shown uh, and their landscape. So oaks are probably the single best plants that support these natural irrigation systems, given their deep and wide root networks. Once the moisture is lifted to the soil surface, it will be shared laterally across the ground with other plants. Okay, so you have an oak here. Its roots are extending way down into the water table, pulling the water up and um, sharing it through a system of roots and uh, mycorrhiza. The mycorrhiza are a fungus that live in the soil and form interactions and symbiosis with uh, the roots. They share nutrients back and forth, and they also help with the transport of water. So your garden will do better if you have trees because of what goes on underground. So natural irrigation systems. So if you employ this technique, you can look looking more green throughout the year without additional water. Okay, in Palo Alto, our, our water table is about 10 feet down. So not that far, really. Okay, and I just, I love this uh, diagram because you don't really think about what, what's happening under here. But in addition to the sharing of moisture, there's also a sharing of information. Plants actually communicate with, with each other through the root systems. So a lot goes on that we can't see. Okay, so trees first. Find your trees. Think about your trees. What trees that you want? I actually brought, in addition to the Circus occidentalis, I brought two Prunus virginianus. These are deciduous, but they are powerhouses in terms of what they feed. Okay, so I only brought the good stuff today. Um, but we do have a number of shrubs um, here, lots and lots. And shrubs provide a variety of floral and vegetative resources as well as habitat. Um, shrubs persist. They don't just die off after a year. And they provide structure. And they can provide a nurse role for establishing other plants. Once you have your trees, you plant your shrubs. Okay? And here I have pictures of what I like to call the big three, Arctostaphylus here with a bumblebee feeding on the tubular flower here, um, the Eriogonum here with another bumblebee feeding, and then uh, Ceanothus over here with a, a honeybee. So again, just a handful of the many thousands that we have available. So once you've decided which shrubs, um, well, actually, let's talk a little bit about I have to show off some of my photography here. Um, so at one of our gardens, we have um, this particular Ceanothus variety called Valley Violet. It blooms early. And we have a couple of different kinds of bumblebees in Palo Alto. This is uh, Bombus melanopigus, the black-tailed bumblebee. You can see she has a cute little black stripe on her butt there. It's a really adorable thing. Um, and they come out early in January, even when it's cold, because bumblebees can control their body temperatures. They use their flight muscles to warm themselves up, so they come out early. So you need something blooming early, and Ceanothus is a favorite of these uh, bees, although 
they are generalists, meaning they will feed at a lot of different kinds of plants. Um, so getting down to the next level, perennials. Um, and I brought a couple of perennials here. Um, this is Erigeron. This is a variety called Wayne Roderick. It's actually um, super easy to, it's a coastal species. It's easy to get cuttings from to get starts. Um, but again, lots of different choices here. Um, and really, um, you know, you can go with a color scheme. You can go with what you have in terms of sun, shade, moisture to decide what you want in your garden. Here are a couple of pictures of bees on, this is Peritoma arborea. And then this is actually not a bee, it's a fly on Peritoridia. We, have, we can tell it's a fly because it has very short antennae versus the very long antennae of bees and big round eyes versus these sort of oval shaped eyes that bees have. A few more pictures of bees on perennials. Like I said, I like to see who likes what. And um, we have, um, this is a Melissoides species here on um, an aster, a leaf cutter over here on Areophyllum. You can tell it's a leaf cutter because she has a different kind of abdomen here where she collects pollen. Very cute looking. Um, on Hillinium puberulum, another leaf cutter. Again, you can see uh, with the abdomen there. And then on Grindelia camporum. Oh, Grindelia, everybody loves it, especially the smaller bees. Annuals. Oh, yes, but wait, there's more. Um, annuals, again, so annuals are basically plants that live one year. They go and they bloom and they spread their seeds. Why annuals? Um, I always like to provide areas to grow annuals because there's a huge variety of floral resources that you can get. Um, and annuals are the most under threat natives from competition from non-native grasses. Um, not typically available in nurseries, so if you're a true plant connoisseur, you can get something that nobody else has. Um, early color, super easy, super affordable with a long bloom time. If you uh, sow them successively every couple of weeks. You go out and add some more seed. You can extend the bloom time. And many will reseed in place. So you'll have them coming back in the same spot year after year after year. You can grow them under taller shrubs. You can grow them in pots. Seeds are great for growing plants because it pre preserves genetic diversity. Okay, if you get cuttings, you're basically cloning plants. But seeds are wonderful because they have a lot of genetic variation in them. They're not, no two seeds are the same, but every cutting that comes from a plant is the same. Here are three easy annuals. Poppies. Um, poppies only produce pollen for eating purposes. And most honeybees, you're not gonna see them on poppies because poppies are buzz pollinated, meaning that in the anther, the place where the pollen comes out, there are little holes, and the anthers have to be shake, shaked at, shaken at the right frequency to release the pollen. Honeybees don't do that. They don't do it to tomatoes either. Tomatoes are the same, same issue. They're, they're buzz pollinated. A lot of different crops are, so honeybees are not the whole story. Um, Gilea capitata, super easy um, from seed, and this is copiously seedy. It will give you pounds of seed, um, so you can give it away um, in large bags. And then, of course, another easy, super great plant, uh, Phacelia tanacetifolia, which is a member of the borage family. Some people plant borage thinking it's really good, but it's not native. We can plant a native one here that provides copious amounts of nectar, okay, the sugar water that the uh, bees like so much, and also some pollen. You can see a little tiny bee having a snack there. Seeds. I love seeds. I probably have about 75 species of seeds at home with more coming in the mail because I can't help myself. <laughs> and um, I like to start things. Um, if I don't know how easy they are to germinate, what I'll do, because <laughs> I'm just such a nerd, is I will take coffee filters, wet them down after I've labeled them so I can remember what I put in them, 
stick the seeds in, put them into a plastic bag, and then put them in the refrigerator. Some take three months to germinate. I'm impatient. I don't like to wait to see if there's seeds coming up out of the soil. I like to see action. So I'll, every few days, I'll check on the seeds to see if they start to sprout. And once they have, you can see here's a little tiny seed there and the tiny little radical, the little root tip coming out at the end of my scientific uh, apparatus of the toothpick. And then my super elaborate planting container. Um, you don't have to be, you know, really too uh, elaborate with seeds. They'll grow in dirt um, just fine. So that's called uh, cold stratification. And I like to pre-germinate things because I know it's going to be just a couple of days when I get to see the leaves after I plant the seeds rather than waiting for three months. Um, and it gives me something to do, um, keeping me out of trouble. So, um, Some other great annuals. Um, the Clarkia amoena mix. It's a, also a larval food source and a showstopper. So if you want to stop traffic, you plant these, and people will think that you are master gardener extraordinaire. They're so easy to grow. You can just throw these seeds on the ground, cover them over with a little tiny bit of compost, and they come up just fine. These are especially attractive to bees because they have markings on the petals that guide bees down to the nectar areas there. Again, Phacelia tanacetifolia. This is an annual that's fused in insectaries all around the world because it provides a lot of nectar. And here we have another bumblebee here. This looks like Bombus vosnesenskii, um, a female. You can see she's got uh, the pollen here on her back leg, and it's the blue pollen of the Phacelia. Bumblebee magnet. If you love bumblebees, they're so cute, plant this and you will have bumblebees show up, guaranteed. So, but what are pollinators? So many. I have a little poster over here that shows the variety of morphologies that we have. Um, and these are relative sizes. These are not actual sizes. What I mean by relative. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't have anything that can really sit in your hand. But this is the largest bee that we have in North America. It's the carpenter bee, which I'm sure most of you know of, versus the little tiny perdita, the fairy bees. So they, they range in different sizes. But that makes sense because we have so many different kinds of plant species. One size does not fit all. And all these bees have very different morphologies from how they carry pollen to um, the way they eat pollen and nectar, um, antenna length, lots of different uh, variations. But it all seems to work out pretty well. So, what are pollinators? Pollinators move the pollen from the male part of the flower to the female part, which causes fertilization of the flower to produce seeds. The vast majority are insects. Okay, 1,600 species in California do most of the work, but other insects like butterflies, moths, beetles, wasps, flies, and so on, they pollinate incidentally. They just happen to be in the flower, and the pollen uh, hits the female part accidentally. Uh, other things like hummingbirds and bats also pollinate incidentally. Um, how effective they are in terms of getting pollen onto the female part, it's actually said that only about 1% of a plant's pollen ends up on the, the, the female part. Um, so a lot of plants do produce copious amounts. So how effective uh, they are depends on their ability to carry pollen because they want you want pollen from one plant to go to a different plant to keep genetic diversity. What are the grooming habits of these organisms? What is their foraging behavior like? Okay. What is their body size and shape like? Okay. So as you can see, lots of different sizes and shapes. Um, tongue length, long versus short. Generalists, do they visit a variety of flowers like bumblebees? Although. Um, bumblebees exhibit what's called floral constancy. They stay with one species at a time um, versus specialists that only visit one species of flower. Um, and here we have over here on Calicordus luteus, one of our uh, native bulbs that we have, a small bee um, on the anther here having, um, gathering up some pollen. Quick fact, 
75% of our native bee live in nests underground or pre-existing cavities. So uh, lots to consider on these marvelous creatures. Floral resources. So what do flowers off offer for bees? Uh, pollen. Pollen equals protein. Okay. Uh, few insects other than bees rely on pollen as a sole protein source to feed their larvae. In fact, I think it's like maybe one species of wasp and a couple species of ants, but bees are really the only species, other species that feeds their young pollen for protein. Wasps will capture other insects to feed their larvae, um, which, you know, is handy protein, but pollen um, doesn't fight back, which is good. Um, and you can get um, two and a half to 61 percent of protein in a pollen. Um, there's fats, starches, vitamins, and minerals. And pollen is very stable. It can persist for thousands of year, years, even though it might not be viable. Um, it's very uh, stable because of the structure of pollen. Um, and it's not all cre created equally. Um, some bee species vary in their ability to digest different pollens. And bees that are fed um, pollen that they're not accustomed to may not survive. So pollens provide different, different pollens provide different nutrients for different species. Pollen is generally yellow, but it comes in other colors. And the color comes from the sticky lipid coating, the pollen kit. By lipid, I mean fatty. Um, and the pollen kit is made of these saturated and unsaturated lipids, carotenoids, flavonoids, proteins, and carbohydrates. And that part's easily digestible. What's interesting to me is that pollen may also play a role in cloud formation, which uh, because uh, pollen, pollen kit actually has the ability to uh, condense water because it is a fatty uh, acid. So um, here we have uh, the yellow-faced bumblebee, Bombus vosnesenskii, one of the two that we see in the Bay Area, um, has a longer tongue. It prefers the tubular flowers and higher protein pollen, which makes a lot of sense because they're bigger than some of the smaller bees, so higher protein is probably good. And it feeds on a variety of things. We've got it on, that looks like gilia, uh, areogonum here, poppies, uh, acnispon, asters, scrofularia, monardella. So they'll, they'll eat a variety of things. What else do flowers provide? Uh, nectar resources um, and other substances. Nectar is sugar. Everything loves sugar. Sugar is good. Um, and there are different types of sugars in nectar. Uh, sucrose, glucose, fructose, maltose, and so on, which varies in concentrations. Um, and uh, it varies from species. And if you think about it, less concentrated nectar, something that's a little bit wa more watery, is easier to drink through a straw, which is basically what a long tongue is on the bees. So um, bees like bumblebees with a long tongue are going to prefer flowers that have a watery nectar, because it's hard to suck up something viscous through a straw. If you've ever had a really thick milkshake, you know, it takes a while if it's really frozen to suck up through a straw. Um, and which is why you often see bumblebees on tubular flowers, because the flower structure keeps the, uh, the nectar from evaporating. So it's like a little nectar humidor. Um, so uh, resins and oils also available um, for bees. They use it to waterproof their brood cells. Um, because they live underground, um, ground gets wet. So how do you keep these uh, areas from getting wet? They actually lick the uh, chambers that they have underground and coat them with uh, these uh, substances to keep their larvae protected, which blows my mind. Um, and some of those uh, resins and oils have antimicrobial properties, again, to protect the be developing bee larvae. Only the females provide the, the, the substance, uh, substances for the larvae to eat. They'll go underground with their, their pollen uh, collection, lay an egg, put a pollen loaf down there, seal off a chamber, go out and do it again. The males, they'll emerge and come out, and they don't have any nests to go to. They like to hang out in flowers for naps and things, and they fly around, and they eat, and they mate, and they die. 
So the ability to carry pollen. So this is really a fun thing to look at. So depending on the species, the legs or abdomens of, fe uh, spe of the females are equipped with specialized hair or scopa. So here we have a melisoides on an aster, and you can see uh, a nice big pollen load there. Um, other bees have areas on the hind legs that are flattened or slightly concave, which is called the corbicula or the pollen basket, surrounded by hairs. Um, and they groom pollen from their furry bodies down into those areas for transport. Some bees also carry the pollen in their crops, which is kind of like a stomach. Here we have a little leaf cutter bee flying into Hoida avicularis. And although they can fly really long distances, they don't like to fly very far if they don't have to. So most prefer to travel between about 150 feet to about 1,500 feet between nests and flowers. So areas that are devoid of plants are bees. Okay. Here's some great pictures of a, a female Bombus melanopigus, the black-tailed bumblebee. And She's going after the nectar, but here are the anthers of the ceanothus, and you can see that the pollen is sticking to her fur, and then she's collected it into a nice little ball there. Um, bees, when they're flying around, generate uh, opposite electrical charge to flowers, so that when they land on a flower, the pollen is attracted to the bee and jumps off, essentially, onto their, their fur. Okay, And so um, this is a good choice, again, um, for those uh, bumblebees who um, emerge early in winter. Here's another bee. Um, she's gathering um, pollen from a Grindelia flower. Note she's got her abdomen curled under so that the pollen grains can fall back, uh, down here and then she collects them into her, uh, her fuzzy legs. And notice her antennae, what they're doing. The antennae provide a sense of touch, smell, and taste, and kind of a hearing. So I think antennae are super cool. I'd love to have a couple of tongues on the top of my head to reach and touch things before I taste them. I always try to think about what that would be like. Um, and again, here we have another one. And she's gathering pollen from Salvia apiana her, with her mouth parts there and her front legs. And then she'll uh, collect the pollen into her uh, scopa there for transport back to the nest. A few bee facts. Okay. Um, what to plant for bees in general? Um, well, we know that bees don't really see red, but they can see ultraviolet. So that clues us in that they're going to really prefer blue and purple flowers. So we have a predominance of blue and purple flowers in our gardens. Blue and purple generally mean nectar. Um, whereas white and yellow mean pollen. And again, some flowers do have those ultraviolet patterns that we can't see but tell bees where to go to get the good stuff. Um, and you can almost tell what flowers bees will like, especially bumblebees, um, based on the flower morphology. Bumblebees like tubular flowers that are symmetrical with two or more colors um, and a nice landing area. And here we have a beautiful metallic green sweat bee on Aster chilensis. This was actually in my front yard. I was very excited to see this bee. I had not seen it before um, because I think the color is almost like uh, Tiffany style ceramics. Speaking of Tiffany, the color is just incredible peacock blue color. Um, and I start, after I saw this bee, I really started to see bees as uh, biological robots because of their, their, their Exoskeletons look to me to be almost mechanical in nature. Very elegant creatures. So how do you do it? How do you create a habitat plan? How do you get these creatures in your yard to enjoy? OK, so this is one of the plans that I, I drew up for our Island Drive pollinator garden habitat. This is what those look like. And I don't typically color a planting plan like this, but I like to do it to uh, let the neighbors know in our outreach that we do to the neighborhoods um, what it's all going to look like. So we have big masses of flowers and plants. The first thing that you need to do when you create a plan, really any kind of planting plan um, or landscape plan, 
measure your site because you've got to know how much space you, you're going to be working in. Okay? Um, this was Island Drive before. This is me actually measuring it, pulling the soft tape here, making notes of everything from the broken down irrigation to uh, utilities and so forth. So after you're done measuring your site, depending on how you're going to transmit those measurements into a paper drawing, a plan, um, I, use, I like to use um, or have people use graph paper because one single square can equal one foot. Makes it easy to draw a plan. Okay? And if you have graph paper, which is each square is a quarter inch, then you can do a scale. One quarter inch equals one foot. Makes it easy. You want to show any existing item on your plan that will stay, like hose bibs, trees, really everything that's going to stay, things that are going to go, um, make it as informative as possible, and add a north arrow. So that's kind of a mechanical thing. Um, and then once you have things figured out in terms of your site plan, before you add plants, before you put in the trees, put your pathways in. Put your patios in. Put your places where you want to have a picnic table. Put those structures in first, because what that does is that creates a form in your garden. They can be straight paths. They can be curvy paths. Paths are very important for being able to get into a garden to maintain it. So draw your path first. I know you're excited to like jump in there and throw the plants in. But do the structure for the humans first, and then throw the plants in. So you'll have your plant palette. Remember, you're going to figure out, OK, I'm going to plant these six trees, these 20 shrubs, and these 50 perennials, and so on. And what you can do, because you have a scale drawing, then you can draw in the plants to scale. And so I like to tell people, use a circle. That shows the diameter at the mature size, that number that you get from Calscape so that you don't crowd your plants. This is how you get the spacing correct. Okay? Um, so circles, the mature diameters, should overlap slightly or just touch. Okay? You want to plot in odd numbers for massing. It just looks better. Um, and you want to plant the same species of plants in masses of at least three feet in diameter to enhance the foraging efficiency. Bees like to stay on one type of flower at a time, and so you'll decrease the amount of time it takes for them to fly from one plant to another plant to another plant if they're all close together. And it's more efficient for them in terms of uh, collecting what they need to feed their larvae. Okay. Um, again, trees first. Find the spots for your trees, and it's Everything starts to sort of fall into place then. OK, we know our big trees are going to go here, here, and here. OK, we're going to have space underneath. And then we figure in our shrubs. OK, and then maybe some perennials. And then you can figure out spaces for annuals and bulbs and things like that. You definitely want to leave space for nesting. OK, 75% of bees live underground. So areas of bare dirt are just fine. In fact, you want to see things nesting in the ground because that means there's lots of fun reproduction happening, and that will keep uh, the ecosystem working. My method for planting uh, these areas, because um, I'm kind of lazy, I don't like to go out on site, is that, um, for, and this was one I just completed um, for the city of Palo Alto, you don't need a precisely uh, scaled drawing for hard, for if you don't need one for hardscape or building that's down to the inches in accuracy, I like to take a, a scaled Google Earth image that can work. So I take a screenshot of the area that I want to plant, and then I know that the sidewalk here is five feet wide, and so I take it into my digital drafting program and scale it so that I know it's accurate. I know it's actually two size. And you can get the AutoCAD program for free, if you're a nonprofit teacher or other environmental group, you just have to ask Autodesk, and they will provide it. So this works uh, great for areas that don't have a lot of tree cover, like this. Here would be more difficult, because I really can't see what's under there. Um, so again, adding the pathways first. Here's a 
Embarcadero Road in Palo Alto. There's a school on this side with a road coming in, chain link fence here, a picnic table, some existing trees on site, okay? But then I added some trees, okay? I know that this one here, um, that's gonna be Quercus labata, the valley oak. I'd like to see more valley oak in Santa Clara County. Um, it used to be 61% of the tree cover down there. Now it's 1%. So that just stabs me in the heart every time I see some other trees go in when we could have beautiful valley oaks. Um, and then, so trees, then your shrubs, okay, in big masses like that, um, and then um, perennials. So the basics, again, um, the plant palette, you should have at least three species for each of the early, mid, and late bloom times. And this is a great place to start. You don't have to feel overwhelmed with like 70 or 80 species. Start with nine, okay? Um, for, and this is kind of the minimum, so you can get your backbone shrubs and trees in there um, because pollinators emerge at different times. So if you provide overlapping bloom times, things that bloom early, things that bloom mid, things that bloom late, you'll keep a lot of uh, different kinds of species coming into the garden. Um, they say, a garden with at least 20 different types of blooming plants is ideal for attracting a diversity of pollinators, although some species indicate really between 60 to 80 species really bumps up the diversity in what you see for attracting pollinators. Again, uh, plant in masses of a single species at least, at least three feet or more in diameter. Um, and I can't stress enough that more is better than less, okay, because in one study, 85% of 41 bee species required all the pollen for more than 30 flowers for one larva. That's a lot. Other species required all the pollen from over 1,000 flowers for one larva. These bees work hard, okay? Um, leave bare dirt areas, morning sun and afternoon shade is good for ground-dwelling bees. Again, choose and then plant. Trees first, then shrubs then perennials, etc. Here's a, a shrub that I like to use a lot, Eriogonum fasciculatum, attractive to a lot of different kinds of insects. We've got gray hair streak butterflies, skippers, we got flies, we got bees, we got beetles. Everybody loves this plant. It's a wonderful plant. Design tip. So when I was up at Olympic National Forest, which was amazing, beyond amazing. I could just literally look everywhere I looked. Their nature was very layered and very complex. And I could just point my camera in one direction and get a shot like this, a million acres like this. Sadly, a million acres is not going to be enough to save the planet. We have 40 million acres of lawn in this country. Okay, one million acres of national park is not gonna do it. We need to transform our lawns, which is 40 million acres, into this. And here, this is an area maybe four feet by four feet. We've got a tree, we've got succulents, we've got a ground cover arctostaphylus, we've got a grass species, we've got roses coming up. Nature wants to be complicated. Nature wants to be layered. So, layer things together, okay. Once everything is planted, how do, you, how do you maintain it? This is always the, the key sticking point. And because I take care of a number of pollinator gardens in Palo Alto, I try to keep the work down to a minimum because it's work. <laughs> and I really uh, don't like to work that hard. Um, so uh, basically, the main thing, the, really the main thing, is just to keep the weeds at bay. Okay, um, we, our gardens are irrigated, but we're slowly moving to drier regimen to keep things um, nice. And then um, don't water on the hot days. What that does, it, dis it will destroy the mycorrhiza that form the symbiosis underground. Okay, because the soil will be warm and wet, which invites pathogens in, which will kill the mycorrhiza, which will then kill the plants. 
um, wait to clean up and prune the garden when activity is low. Um, yes, a question? How about in the evening on a hot day? Like if you were to go far right now, would that be all right? Uh, if you wanted, if things looked really wilty and things, I would wait until, I would set the ar irrigation to maybe 3 o'clock in the morning when it's the absolute coolest temperature possible. Yeah. Um, wait to prune and clean up the garden when activity is super low. You don't have to fertilize. Fertilizer actually can get into the water table and from the water table can get into the bay and cause algal blooms. Okay. So, um, and you don't have to spend the money, really. Um, to mulch, uh, I mulch to control some weeds and to establish and then I basically have let the mulch be eaten down by soil organisms, but we tend to mulch our pathways where we have those. Um, sometimes in my own garden, um, I will put what I like to call the skim coat of bark chips on the top of leaves that I use for mulch to make things look tidy. It can make one bag of mulch spread all over the yard. It's one chip deep. Um, leave areas of bare dirt for nests. Don't use leaf blowers. Bad. Leaf blowers actually blow insects off of plants and they dry them out. So it's counter, uh, counterproductive. Obviously, don't use pesticides, herbicides, or fungicides. Uh, you can let your annuals dry out. You can clip, clip them down or just leave them. If you're in a fire prone area, probably best to cut them down. Um, and here we have. Uh, in my own yard, Gilea capitata, this nice annual. I love this because here we have, this looks like uh, the black-tailed bumblebee, and you can see the blue pollen on the head here. Um, just really a beautiful uh, combination. Leaves as mulch. Ecosystem services of plants do not just end when the when the leaves drop, those leaves actually perform uh, ecosystem services as well. Uh, they help prevent weeds, hold soil in place, uh, keep moisture in, insulates the soil, and so forth, keeps soil cool, and provides a place for insect species to overwinter, as the birds will discover quickly. Um, insects that are eating leaves of plants don't necessarily stay up there as pupa or larva. They often drop to the ground, burrow into the leaf litter or the plants underneath, and spend the winter that way. Okay. Uh, leaves encourage fungal decomposition, which is great. Um, we like fungus. Um, you can shred leaves if you want. Um, that's an extra step too far for me. I like to just leave them in place. Um, and you can rake them into small areas around trees and shrubs, and just be careful not to place them up against the trunks and the stems because that will trap moisture up against uh, uh, the trunks that can bring in pathogens. Um, and really a couple of inches deep. You don't have to get crazy. These are, this is the leaf mulch in my own yard. That's my hand and a dirty glove. Um, they break down pretty quickly. And my yard is full of salamanders, which are, um, Photons is protein. I have a lot of birds that are happy with me. Pruning decisions. Um, again, because my gardens are habitat, um, eh, pruning is highly overrated, I think, sometimes. Um, because, again, insects, what are they doing? Um, those, there might be some that are overwintering. So like here on Salvia apiana, the insect, maybe to undergo metamorphosis, has pulled the leaf around them for, for protection because every insect is somebody else's meal out there. I mean, it's, it's insect eat insect out there. The wasps are looking for goodies. Um, you know, spiders are looking for things. Lizards are looking for things. So it's sometimes hard to see insects because they don't want to be seen, especially when they're in a vulnerable state because that's what we call an easy lunch. <laughs> so, um, so hiding is good if you're an insect. So I always look very carefully before I uh, prune anything. And so um, sometimes we get, this looks like some kind of weird mealy bug. Eh, I don't, I don't worry about these because I remind myself that every bug is something else's meal. And even if you have aphids, 
Aphids, really, if you start seeing them as the soft-shelled crab of the insect world, they'll be gone pretty soon because it's food. Protons, or photons is protein. And then here we have um, a dry branch of Scrofularia californica, um, the so-called figwort or bee plant. And I saw those and I was like, oh, what are those? Those are katydid eggs. And those eggs were on this particular branch for months before they hatched. Many insects only spend a very short time as adults. Most of the time for insects is spent as a larva or an egg, okay? And they wait for the appropriate time to come out, quickly mate, and die after they've laid a few eggs, okay? So, um, you know, again, pruning decisions. Look closely to, to decide, eh, am I gonna prune? Eh, maybe not today. Maybe I'll come back in a couple months. Ongoing decisions. Um, do your research. You've got the CalScape database, which can take up a lot of fun time in the evenings. Um, ask yourself, does this plant provide forage for local insect species? Okay, who am I feeding? Um, how much water is needed? Maybe I should plant some more trees. Uh, does this plant provide nesting opportunities? How hard is it to grow? Try it as a full-size plant. Try it as a seed. You know, experiment. Have fun with it. We have almost 8,000 species of plants here in California, more than any other state. We have riches in the state. We are, it's really almost embarrassing how rich the state is in biological diversity. Um, how does this plant enhance pollinator resources in the garden? Okay, um, look and see what's happening in your yard. Am I assisting a northerly migration of this species? Because we're expecting that the climate is going to get warmer, we're going to see maybe some Southern California species migrating north. One of the great things about the CalScape database is that it shows ranges of these plants, okay, where they typically grow. Some plants might be slightly below our area, but maybe in 20 years they'll be in this area because it's hotter up here, like Southern California. We don't know that. That might be a consideration. Um, how connected is this garden to other natural spaces? This particular idea of connectedness is so important, okay? What we know when gardens are connected to each other is that that helps decrease the rate of local extinction if gardens are connected. That means we can have gene flow between areas. So if populations are isolated, it's more easy for that population to completely be wiped out than if you can have them to move out of an area and mingle with other species, others of their species, okay? One other thing that we know about connected gardens is that the more connected a garden that you have, the more native species will move into that space. You know, it's like there's something that's happening that's very mysterious. Nature's worked that all out. We're still figuring out why that is. Again, um, I do a lot of macro photography. I'm always looking very closely before I do anything. In fact, I'm always afraid I'm going to be interrupting somebody's meal or nesting or mating or whatever they're doing. Um, and information is not revealed all at once. And our information is always growing, so I don't know everything. I'm always trying to find out more. So I, before I act, I try to see if what I'm doing is really an optimal decision in terms of enhancing the environment and uh, adding more resiliency to it. Um, we know that the world of bees and insects, their scale is very different from ours. For, and they experience the world differently than we do. Uh, because of their small size, flying is more like swimming because the air is more viscous to them than it is for us. And I was out taking a picture one day of this flower because I was very interested in what the pollen looked like. Um, I spent a lot of time looking at plants and things. But what I didn't notice was a tiny little juvenile katydid, and I only noticed it after I'd taken the picture. So sometimes these things actually appear to you once you start looking closely, okay? 
So consider the insect perspective here. It saw me before I saw it, and I only saw it because I took a picture of it. So easy to miss. I'll leave you with some final thoughts here. Among other ecosystem services, the more that you understand about the interrelationships of nature, your appreciation and enjoyment of nature's complex beauty will be enhanced. And that's my message to you this evening. Thank you. <laughs>